Hi, and welcome to the Gut Reset Summit. I'm your host, Dr. John Dempster, and I'm thrilled to have a very special guest today, Dr. Javen Moore. And Dr. Javen Moore is a doctor of chiropractic located in Kansas City who works virtually with clients through using functional medicine to assist them in overcoming chronic health conditions. And he's got quite the story. At the age of 25, he went from being an award-winning college athlete to not being able to get out of bed. And he sought countless doctors looking for answers, but doctors only gave him Band-Aid solutions. And he was later diagnosed with Lyme disease. And once he overcame this complex infection, he dedicated his entire practice to helping clients discover the causes of their symptoms. And Dr. Moore thus specializes in Lyme disease, PANS and PANDAS, autism, parasitic infections, and environmental toxicities. And he and his team welcome patients at their clinic, Redefining Wellness Center down in Kansas City. So welcome, Javen, to the show. Now, oh, thank you for having me. It's uh, such an awesome opportunity to be able to spread the word about Lyme disease today. Yeah, and I know, I mean, I've already kind of tipped the hat on, on your story, but uh, you have quite the story. And this is always kind of where I start these these interviews is like, tell me, how did you get here? And, you know, how did your journey evolve beyond what I've already told everyone today? You know, I was a uh, collegiate athlete, All-American high school, college, and thought things were going to be amazing. I, I dreamed of being a professional athlete, even though I'm only 5'10", so that probably wouldn't have happened. But um, I got into chiropractic school and the fell floor out. The the floor just fell out from under me. I, I started losing uh, brain capacity, body capacity, but erectile dysfunction hit me. So my hormones just crashed. And at 25 years old, bounce around doctors. They're just going, no, you're fine. You know, sometimes that just happens. Here's the little pill you can take to fix that. And I'm like, that's not really acceptable to me. Um, I'm healthy. I'm fit. I sleep. I do all the things I'm supposed to be doing. Why is my body not working? And like so many people out there, they bounce around from doctor to doctor, getting told all oh, this is in your head, or it could be that, or it could be this. That was my story. And, and it was just frustrating. I was in Cairo school. So I initially went natural medicine and then I went to Western because I wasn't getting answers. And then I went from that to just kind of searching on my own. And finally, somebody's like, have you heard of Lyme disease? And I was like, yeah, but you know, they're like, well, you could have that. I go, all right, well, who do I go see? And there's no answers. There's no like, this guy can help you out. Um, so that was the beginning of my story. And, and finally, once I got well, you know, it became my mission to not be just one of the doctors for other people. I wanted to be the last doctor in the line, I wanted to be the guy that could get to the bottom of things and find the causations so we could actually get things done. That's what a powerful story. And you and I both being in functional medicine know that this is such an opportunity to help people with chronic Lyme disease really start to put the puzzle pieces together. And we do that uh, with our patients here. But a big part of what we see and why we're chatting today is, you know, a lot of Lyme, it mimics a lot of different symptoms. But we see this time after time again, mimicking a lot of the gut issues. Like, what have you seen with with your practice with the Lyme gut connection? You know, Lyme causes a myriad of symptoms. It's called a great mimicker. So there's more than 150 symptoms associated with it. And it's, Lyme is never alone. So people think of Lyme. Um, Lyme is Borrelia burgdorferia, which is a bacteria. But it suppresses the immune system so well, it allows parasites and GI dysbiosis into the body. but it also gets into your brain. And when it gets into your brain, it can happen within 12 hours of a tick bite. So a lot of people are told, oh, just get doxycycline within the first two weeks and you're good and you'll be fine. Well, within 12 hours, that tick bite can produce an infection that then gets to your brain. Once it's in the brain, it starts affecting so many different functions. The biggest function that I see is it starts to stress out your nervous system and your immune system. When this happens, people start developing food allergies because their body is a shoot first, ask questions later kind of response. So you eat food, it goes in, and immediately your body's just like, I'm under too much stress, I'm gonna attack this, whatever it is. It doesn't matter if it was your favorite food that you've been eating for 20 years, all of a sudden now you're allergic to it, or if it's something brand new that you know would make a little bit more sense. So I see that nervous system fight or flight state create a lot of food allergies. Well, also when you're in a fight or flight state, your liver doesn't detoxify as well because it's more in survival mode than it is in this rest digest and heal type state so when the liver starts to back up it's using up all your bile your bile is something that's stored in your gallbladder produced by the liver and it coats your digestive tract 
So by coating your digestive tract, it allows for different foods to go through, fats to be digested, bacteria to stay in the center, not start leaking out through the gut. So as this starts to break down because the toxicity is not being kept up by your liver, now we're becoming low bile. So I've seen people do a lot of gallbladder bile work and see significant reductions in stomach issues. And this can be contributed to majorly by Lyme. So those are just two of the ways that I've seen Lyme majorly affect the digestive tract specifically, not even going into all of its co-infections and other friends that can cause colitis, digestive tract breakdown, um, the parasites that come in are, that are involved causing colitis, uh, your, meaning uh, ulcerative colitis or even Crohn's. Yeah, no, we absolutely. This is such a powerful, powerful talk today because, you know, not only are you impacting one of the greatest foundations of all of our health, which is our gut, but you're bringing in all these other uh, organs into it as well once that vulnerability has been breached. So let's, you mentioned something earlier about leaky gut. Let's just touch on that for a moment. This is always a hot topic, uh, but it's known as intestinal permeability in some arenas. But tell us a little bit more about this Lyme, excuse me, gut, Lyme, leaky gut connection. Yeah, so leaky gut is where basically you have this nice lining in your gut. It has a couple of stacked different layers. The first layer out there is a mucosal layer. This mucosal layer is produced by specific bacteria. And if those bacteria break down, then the, the mucus will start to disintegrate. As that happens, now all the stuff going through your gut, all the immune responses, all the infections and the toxins like glyphosates and bacteria and parasites actually start to get to the villi, your digestive tract, which is that cellular lining through the gut. And once they hit, get to the actual gut, they start to break down the cells that are held together by things called like tight junctions. You can think of these as like little fingers holding things together. And if as those break down or as it lyses cells, so as, as you break down the cells, the cells become damaged, all this stuff gets into your body. So stuff, meaning food particles, toxins, infections, immune responses, all that gets starts to get into your bloodstream. Once that gets into your bloodstream, your body starts to identify all of that as a invader. It doesn't matter if it's good, bad, if it's you, a part of your own tissue or an infection. It starts to identify because it's not supposed to be in the bloodstream. So immediately it's this immune response. That immune response goes systemic throughout the entire body because initially it's just localized immune, but as it keeps coming through that hole, now immune factors start to spread out just because your blood's flowing. So you get these immune factors throughout your body. So now one of the most common signs of Lyme, in my opinion, is these rheumatoid arthritis-like feelings. So if, if somebody walks into my clinic and says, I have rheumatoid arthritis or I have achy, tight muscles, joints, especially in the hands and the feet, my first thought that I go to immediately is we need to check for Lyme. I'm not saying you have it, but we need to check for it immediately. And then, so as the gut breaks down, all these infections start to get into your bloodstream, your immune system is making reactions. Well, if the immune system doesn't stop it right there, if it's unable to seal that hole, which in most of our cases, we don't have just one time where there's a little break and the body heals it. It's broken due to the chemical toxicities in our food, the stress in our day-to-day -day life. Again, remember I said the tick bite gets to your brain within 12 hours that infection gets there. Well, when fight or flight gets hit, this starts affecting the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is this really long nerve. That's the great wandering nerve. So it goes from your brain, goes and directly innervates your gut. So when the connection between your brain and gut starts to break down because of the Lyme strain and stress on your brain, now the gut doesn't operate appropriately. So healing isn't going to happen as quickly as it can. Immune function isn't going to be happening correctly. There might be misfires causing some of those irritations and breakdowns. There might be a lack of controlling the bacteria in your gut that's supposed to be healthy. Because by the way, guys, we all have E. coli. We all have some H. pylori and 40,000 other named bacteria that can be either healthy, symbiotic, beneficial, or they can be pathogenic and damaging. And that's it's not necessarily you cognitively as a choice. It's your body working synergistically or in sort of some equilibrium with these organisms to keep them healthy. So Lyme starts to dysregulate the nervous system, the vagus nerve, which leads to the breakdown of communication, which leads to opportunistic infections, which means the ones that are normally in your gut they can even be healthy commensal bacteria, 
running rampant, causing damage to you. So I know I just named a few different ways that it can affect your body because Lyme is such a weight on your system. It affects you in so many different ways. I mean, I have so many questions. Uh, this is fascinating. And, uh, you know, I we're going to get into this here. But you mentioned earlier, you know, to get detect, to detect Lyme properly means to test properly. And I've had so many patients, probably like yourself, come through and they said, oh, no, my doctor, you know, they tested me for Lyme and I don't have it. But there's different ways of testing for Lyme. Can you elaborate on, you know, what tools and what markers should we be looking for or what labs even are going to be helpful? Because I think we also have to distinguish that there's a big difference, as you mentioned earlier, between acute Lyme. So something you see the tick bite and we notice something within a few hours. And hopefully that's the case because that way we can get on top of it. But then there's something called chronic Lyme, which is such a big bigger different presentation altogether so let's let's just kind of walk that back here how do you diagnose your patients with lyme disease so the standard right now for diagnosis of lyme is actually symptomatic but there are some labs that are starting to come along so let's just throw out a few symptoms if you have these symptoms consider lyme it doesn't mean you have it because there's so many overlapping infections out there but that's what my job is that's what your job is is to identify people's symptoms have your differential possibilities there and then go figure it out. So if you have Lyme, a lot of times it's those achy muscles like I was talking about. You get a headache along the backside of your head. This can be due to Lyme or the co-infection Babesia. That's super common. About 40% of people with Lyme have it. It's a parasite, by the way. Um, if you have heart palpitations, a lot of people talk about this pericarditis that is caused so inflammation around the heart that is caused by Lyme disease. Um, and then from there, you can get your more common symptoms that, that cross over too many places, which is fatigue and brain fog, which, of course, if you're getting an infection in your brain, it's very strongly going to cause this. And then we can go from there where you actually start seeing people deal with a lot more just weakness and their body like muscle weakness because your body's using a lot of energy up to deal with these infections. And the most common one that everybody talks about is the bullseye rash. But the bullseye rash only happens in about 40% of the people that actually get bit by Lyme disease. And not to mention this, you could have had a bullseye rash when you were six, no one noticed it. And now you're 20 and you have a, a major stressor in your life that weakens your immune system. And now that infection is opportunistic and takes over. So that's, that's why sometimes it's missed, even if you actually had it. And again, only 40% of people actually have it. So that's the symptoms. And there's, like I said, it's a great memory. There's 150 symptoms. Those are some of the starter points. Now, lab wise, when you get into labs, the most known one is the Western blot or the ELISA that the CDC has backed. Well, the CDC came out and I believe it was like 2015 said, Hey, we tested all these people and about 25,000 were positive, but we think more like 300,000 to a million people were infected. I'm going, wait a minute. So if you've got 25,000 and there was a million infected, we're at what, like less than 8% functionality of this test, that's pretty crappy. So that test for me is just don't even run it. It's not worth your time. So then it goes, okay, what other tests are there? There's Igenix, which has been the gold standard for as long as I've been practicing, so a decade. But it actually just got surpassed by another company called Vibrant America for its sensitivity, uh, just slightly past. So it's still a great test, but Vibrant America is also a really good test. And it tests for if you run the full panel, all these co-infections like Bartonella, Ehrlichia, Babesia, several viruses, mycoplasma, strep A. So I really enjoy the Tickborne 2.0 panel from Vibrant America. It gives me a tremendous amount of information and it's the most accurate test that I can have, but it is not perfect. So make sure if you think you have Lyme, you go to find somebody who is well-versed and understands Lyme can do a symptom assessment. There's the Horowitz questionnaire, which is another questionnaire out there that you can take on your own. And then from there, run good testing and see what's going on and see if you can possibly get a positive. Because it's nice to be able to say, hey, I got a positive on labs. I want to show my family. Otherwise, clinical diagnosis is good enough for me. And as long as you get well, that's what we're, we're looking at. No one really cares if you have a positive over here on a piece of paper, as long as your symptoms go from bad to good. Absolutely. And, I'll, you know, you kind of touched on this. It's such a multi-systemic illness. Gut is one part of that. But, you know, it sounds like you're also looking at other areas, too. Like, are you measuring nutrients? Are you measuring other toxicities? It sounds like you're measuring co-infections, which is great. Um, you know, looking at other different factors in the what we call the functional medicine wheel. 
what does that picture look like? I always consider, you know, if we have a patient that comes in that's really wiped out, whether it's from Lyme or something else, we have to fill their battery up as much as we can. We have to look for the things that are drawing on their battery. What are the other areas and systems that you find that can really impact your outcomes with Lyme? You know, I have recently been able to create a really systematic approach. So we make sure that we we get all your labs and I'm going to go through labs and different markers here. But realistically, I have a, a start point that's in, you got to get a chronological history to figure out when things got going. Has there been assaults on your nervous system that would create a weakened immune system? So was there childhood trauma? There was a study by Kaiser that showed that uh, you're 80% more likely to develop an autoimmunity if you had childhood adverse events. So knowing that tells me maybe how you became vulnerable because a very healthy individual, if nothing was beating you down, Lyme's hard to get. So we've got to have all these other pieces of puzzle. So I always ask people, one, do you live in a safe place? And I go through how that looks. Are we drinking clean water that doesn't have radioactive elements or arsenic or something in it? So you can look that up on ewg.org to make sure your water's clean. Are you eating clean whole foods and eating enough food for you with the proper balance of macros, meaning carbs, fat, and protein? Because if you're starving yourself, you're going to be weaker. Do you use clean hygiene and do you breathe clean air? Clean air meaning, do you have radon in your basement? Are you breathing in mold toxicity? I got one client that lived downwind from a chicken farm and literally at night they had to close up their windows because it got so putridly smelling that their house became almost toxic. So I was like, okay, that's a, a big problem. How do we fix that? But, you know, asking questions helps lead us to understanding this. Then I go, do you feel safe in your own body and in your own environment? Because if you don't, your nervous system's a problem. So if you're dealing with sig- significant anxiety, we we really dive into that, understand where your body's at. Because I need those two pieces to be healthy so that we have a chance to be able to beat Lyme. Because so many people have been dealing with Lyme for 5, 10, 15, 20 years. I mean, 50 years for a couple of clients. So what was the missing link if you've taken all the good herbs and antibiotics and et cetera? And the way that I start to uncover this stuff to ask the right questions is I run our blood test, which is the good functional medicine blood test. Is your kidney, liver, thyroid, do you have inflammation? Are you absorbing B vitamins? Those sorts of things in the blood work. Then I come over and look at an organic acid test. Um, and within the organic acid test, there's 76 tests that, on the one that I run. We're looking at, do you have gut infections, yeast or mold? Do you have oxalates, which come from yeast, mold, or diet, which can break down your mitochondria, cause burning tissue? Do you have a broken down Krebs cycle or fatty acid oxidation, which is your energy producers? If you don't produce energy, you don't fight anything. You don't recover from anything. And two of the biggest things I see cause a problem with those is mold and radioactive elements, which is why that's on my safe place section. To understand what's going on, is your detox pathway able to even work? So do you have enough glutathione? Are you able to methylate? These are questions that I have to figure out to make sure that we're going to be on the right track. And then are you absorbing amino acids? Are you absorbing minerals? So I do a hair tissue mineral test for the minerals to see, can you even absorb food and nutrients to build and mount a reaction. Because if not, then I got to build you up first. So to make all that short, what's your history in a real concise way with all the things that people miss, like dental work and trauma? Do you have energy production lined out to where your body can do it so that we can actually mount reactions? Do you have the nutrients to do that? And are you able to, from there, tolerate supplements which you can see if your body's really stressed out and you're in cell danger response, which you can see if your mitochondria is suppressed, usually you're in cell danger, same cell danger response, meaning your body is going to be in major fight or flight. If you're not in that, then, then we can absorb the supplements, use the supplements and actually get after those infections. So I put all that together. That's kind of my basics. That's the start point for me. Um, we can get way deeper in the weeds. We can run the food panels, the brain inflammation, autoimmune panels, like the neural zoomer. We can go into the mycotoxin or environmental toxin panels, which I love to run those things, but it's, it's really dependent on the person. Right. Which is the functional medicine, right? Is make sure that you customize this to them uh, as best as you Mm -hmm. can. Now on that note, is there a general type of eating plan or diet that you really lean on for most of these Lyme gut types of pictures that you see? You know, I've got this like funnel in my brain that comes down, right? The start of it is whole foods. The start is always whole food, organic diet, right? Like 
eating roughly balanced macros. So most people that I work with chronic illness don't do well on a ton of carbs. So we take their carbs down to about 33% fat and protein, 33%, really balanced. We're, we're not doing anything wild. Now for an individual who they're really sensitive, I might end up going more toward the keto or carnivore type diet because I've found that that is really helpful or even fasting. Mm -hmm. If they react a lot to supplements with rashes or um, histamine type things. So, so a lot of sinuses, I might put them on a histamine diet. If we see oxalates in their organic acid test, well, then we're going to do oxalate diet. So I really customize it. But the general gist is let's start with whole food. Like so many Americans today are just not eating that. Now, I bet that if we pulled everybody listening to the summit today, about 80% are going to be eating probably mostly whole food because they've done the work to, and they they committed the time and they're they're listening to us. So that's why I was, I was given those more specific diets of like, if you're hypersensitive, we might go more keto carnivore. If you're histamine, there's a histamine free diet. If you oxalates and you're burning, we go oxalate. And those are the just the, the transitions that I go between based on your labs and, and the symptoms that you're reporting to me. And we may change. I never stick somebody on that long term because lifestyle diet is whole food organic symptomatic diet might be more specific right yeah fascinating and so you know back to just tie in something that we touched on quickly was that gut inflammation sort of conversation in line like let's come back to the inflammation and just unpack that a bit more what what are you seeing on that front like what what are the symptoms that can tell us if our gut is inflamed i know we, we kind of looked at some of the lyme symptoms but do you have any symptoms that you look at just checklist symptoms that are going to tell us if we've got some massive in, inflammation in our gut absolutely so 70 percent of your immune systems in, in the gut is what the the studies all say it's what we all say here in, in medicine so if you're having skin rashing so having those histamine responses all over your skin your face Reacting to food or food allergies, your gut's not right. That's just a, a start point for me. If you've got bloating, constipation, diarrhea, if you wake up in the middle of the night because your stomach's aching or you got to run to the bathroom or even frequent urination, these tell me that there's something's likely happening in your digestive tract that's not supposed to be there. I tell people all the time, I go, you do know, right, that your digestive tract is supposed to work on its own. And you don't really know that it's working besides the fact that it feels a little full after you eat and then it works and you go to the bathroom. Like in a healthy individual, your digestive tract is not on your mind very often. It's just doing its job. But when I ask, because I, at one point I, I had a, uh, a youth soccer club of young girls that came into my clinic, mostly high school. They're extremely good girl uh, soccer girls. And I said, so one that was sitting there who was there for like structural work in my clinic. And I said, how many of your friends out of 10 have a digestive tract symptom? She's like, what do you mean? And I listed off all the things I just said. She's like, oh, like nine or 10 of them. I was like, wait a minute. So it's 90 to hundred percent of your friends. And I started asking this question to basically any female that came into my clinic. Cause I'll just be honest, guys, we just don't talk about things. Like we're too busy thinking about who knows what else or football, who knows? Um, and it, it's it's standard. Eight to 10 is their answer out of 10 have GI issues. This is not normal. We need to unnormalize it. Like we got to get people out there and go, hey, normal digestive function is no bloating, no cramping, no pain, no food allergies. That's normal. So any of that stuff is not normal. If you're dealing with that, you got a gut symptom. Now we just got to figure out why and what. Is it dysbiosis? Is it parasites? Is it stress, mold, Lyme? What is it? Yeah. And I see, especially in those age group of, of patients, uh, I see a lot of stress and there's this massive gut brain connection. In fact, I used to host a summit called the mental wellness summit. So we, we touched on a lot of these points in, in uh, previous events, but this is still such a burning topic, especially what everyone's just gone through in the last few years globally. So, you know, what do you see from a gut brain connection in Lyme disease, you know, what beyond obviously, you know, global, uh, issues that we've got on the you know, the docket right now. Just expand on that a little bit more for me, Jamin. You know, for the average person out there, the gut-brain connection isn't just straightforward. It's not like it is to us where we're thinking about the vagus nerve connection and so on. So I, I bring people back and I just say, you know, how many times do you have a, a friend or a family member that was under a great deal of stress and ended up with loose stool or a digestive tract that becomes a little crampy or achy? 
And they're just like, oh, yeah, that's, that's not unusual. That's pretty normal. If you go into Eastern medicine, you think about the gut. And they say, well, the small intestine is the emotional organ. So that's where you house all of that, which is right by your belly button. So if you start getting a little ache in there. If you look at muscle testers, the ileocecal valve, which is directly, if you go straight down from your nipple on the right side, all the way to right above your hip bone, that gets all crampy when you're stressed out. And then if you look at uh, the skin, the, the Chinese will also say that your skin represents what the intestinal lining looks like. So there's all of these, either if you go way back into ancient Chinese medicine, if you go just talk to your average person, we know that there's a gut brain connection. It's just, it's not talked about. So with my clients, when they come into me initially, like I was mentioning earlier, do you feel safe? That doesn't mean that you feel like a saber tooth tiger is going to chase you. It's just, do you feel like your world is on an edge, whether it's you've got test after test after test coming to high school, or you're worried about the mean girl club, like the movie, or whether or not you work too much, or you're just not getting along with your friends, right? It's like, is there a toxic person in your life that just needs to be maybe, maybe put a boundary up or are they a parasite and they just simply need to be kicked out? Mm-hmm. So that mental health connection to the gut is key. If you don't get the mental health piece, it's very difficult to get the gut to calm down and relax because it's so interconnected. And like the example I gave earlier, the brain has a nerve called the vagus nerve that actually connects to your gut. So it's not just this, this concept of like, oh, my emotions make me stressed out. It's no, there's literally the vagus nerve in studies have shown a person under immense emotional stress will downregulate the function of your digestive tract. It's amazing. Yeah, I think what is it? Some of the neurotransmitters up to 80% are produced in our gut lining, mm-hmm. uh, depending on the neurotransmitter. We have many, but uh, it's just such a powerful, powerful connection. Now, I want to get with the time that we've got, I want to get into a little bit more of what are you doing to, to treat Lyme? Now, again, there's a difference between acute and chronic Lyme. Um, so give me a few more of the, you know, beyond some of the dietary strategies that we've touched on, uh, give me a little bit more of what you're finding to be very helpful for those listening today with chronic Lyme and gut issues. So you said a key word in there, chronic Lyme, right? So chronic versus acute, you talked earlier about acute. If you, if you get an acute tick bite and you can start treatment within say 24 hours and you can really give your body some strength, uh, you know, the, the mainstream medical, again, I said earlier, two weeks doxy. For me, that's not my personal favorite. My personal favorite is to grab some IS Boar, um, which is a product out online from Cellcore. Grab that, get your sized dosing. And I do that for about two to four weeks. That usually helps me. It's not all inclusive though, because the thing that is missed is when a tick bites you and it doesn't have to be a tick. It can be a spider, a tick, a flea, a mosquito, anything that is a Insect-borne vector, those are the most common ways to get Lyme. It can be sexually transmitted or even in embryo transmitted. So from your mother, just to put all that out there. But if it's been there for a while, um, it's chronic. And what I was just, I just skipped on accident. If you get bit by a tick, 12 infections have been shown to be able to be transferred in one bite. Those infections include viruses, bacteria, parasites, mycoplasma. So we've got multiple different types of infections. So two weeks of doxy is not going to knock all those out. Two weeks of IS-4 cannot knock all those out. It's not designed for that. So we're hoping your immune system is strong. So if you've lived a healthy life and are doing the other good things, you're going to be fine. But if you're not, that's when it comes to understanding where a chronic Lyme plays a role. And that's because when you don't touch on all of the different other infections, well, those take infection. Those take up house. You become their host. So now the really key thing for Lyme clients that are chronic is looking at the big picture. So when I start with a client, I do the safe place and the feel safe piece, but then I go into, okay, what are you depleted in? How do we build your mitochondria back, get your mineral content back? That's not unusual out there within medicine to rebuild the nutrients, but it's the order by you healing is really important. So parasites can get into your body. They can come through that tick bite. About 70% are single cellular, but that leaves the other 30% that are multicellular. So you get to start thinking about those big, fat, juicy worms that everybody puts on their, their Instagram page or that I get sent. And they're big enough that Lyme bacteria can actually live inside of them. 
so can viruses. So for me, I want to take away the home that Lyme can run back into. So I get rid of parasites first. Then I go into bacteria, then mycoplasma. Then I'm making sure to flush out any toxicities that are going to keep your immune system dysregulated, like mold, radioactive elements, and heavy metals. And by going in that order, I've seen really, really good success, but it's individualized. So there there can be a time where I, I go in a different order. But then once I get some of those toxins out, I come back around and I make sure that we break down biofilms. A biofilm or a cyst form of Lyme disease is something that uh, the, the bacteria will protect itself. It'll get itself in a little shell. And in that shell, antibiotics and herbs, they can't get to it unless you break down that shell first. So it's in that protection, it's going to stay until it feels like it's safe. So that's why I start rotating away from bacteria into other things. And then I come back later and I use biofilm disruptors, which would be things like proteolytic enzymes, cystis T. There are other things out there that people use, but those are the things that I primarily use or BFB one or two from Supreme Nutrition, which is a topical essential oils. They help break down those cis form biofilms and that allows for you to get to those more deep Lyme bacteria. So I'm, I'm covering all my bases. And to be honest, once you've gotten rid of the majority of those pathogenics and majority of those toxins, now your body's going to be strong enough that if a few bacteria come out of their cyst form, you're going to be able to take care of them anyway. So although I'm touching on them, just know that when you get your body optimal, you're designed to stay well. You're designed to defend yourself and heal. Absolutely. Yeah. And you touched on something that I just want to come back to. Massive, massive conversation is biofilms. Do you assume that everybody has biofilms when they're dealing when you're dealing with Lyme and co-infections? Are there any direct clues that would point you towards that uh, assumption more than others? So if you're in chronic state, meaning you've been dealing with this for three to six months or longer, biofilms have been produced. Sure. And we see those things come out. And sometimes they're called rope worm or mucoid plaque or just straight biofilm. And when I start working with people, even just supporting the liver, you start seeing mucoid plaques just start coming out. Oftentimes when I get to like a mold protocol and I've already done parasites, Lyme and mycoplasma, you see this junk coming out. And I mean, it is, it can be a flood. I got clients that are just like, I had one guy and, and he was a, a chronic Lyme mass cell client. And he's actually the guy that, that helped me to learn how to do what I call the pulse method, which is a method I use for mass cell clients. I, I developed for them. We spent years trying to get his body ready for treatment. And then when we started getting it going, he started seeing all these things come out, biofilm, mucoid plaque, rope worm, um, and he just loved it. So he measured it. In one summer, he got 300 feet of this stuff out of him, biofilm, and just kept, I mean, it was just long. He was putting it into a bucket, a five-gallon bucket. And I was just like, more power to you, man. Like, that's gross, but it, it's just like a win. Like, he was just celebrating the win. And he went from on a walker at 30 years old, had lost 60 pounds, couldn't work, couldn't walk five feet on his own. I had him start doing just some like at-home exercises where I just had him like swinging his arms back and forth and then raising his arms up and down. And then um, I wanted him to just like kick his legs, but he couldn't do it standing. So he had to lay down on his back. He last 15 seconds. I got a video six months later. He waved his arms, flapped his, clapped his hands, jumped up and clapped his hands under his legs because we'd removed so much crap from him. They was finally strong enough to be able to function. I mean, it brought a tear to my, like seeing this guy go from, cause we were like the same age going mm -hmm. from Walker to jumping up. I mean, just by removing all this biofilm and junk, of course we were doing protocols throughout this. It was just incredible. There must've honestly, Dr. Javen, it probably triggered back to when you were sick too. And just yeah. gave you that huge wave of emotion. Speaking of the, you know, the rope worms, I think the longest one a patient of ours had recently was six feet in one go. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we do IV therapy, so that can sometimes be quite aggressive to move them out, but it, it was like, it was six feet long. That was one part. So for your patient to get 300 feet, that's in incredible. You know, that's the definition of better out than in, right? Heck yeah, it is. Oh man, I, I, I still get pictures. And by the way, um, for those listening, uh, earmuffs, if you can't handle this kind of conversation about stuff coming out, I've seen parasites while treating for my clients with Lyme come out of eyes, nose, 
and every other orifice, whether it's what we're talking about in the stool or even come out through urine. And then yesterday I had, uh, just even yesterday, she's like, could it be possible it comes out with menstruation? And I was just like, seen it before. So they can literally be anywhere in your body and they can come out anywhere. And when your body becomes healthy and it's no longer a host, when we make you the anti-host, your body starts flooding them out from everywhere. Powerful. I love it. Wow. All right. Anything else we need to know about Lyme and gut from the expert, Dr. Javen Moore? I feel like we've covered so many things. The biggest thing is this people on your Lyme forums, people out there that are struggling. You can't heal. I don't care if it's been six weeks, 16 years or 60. I've had a client come in after 50 years. I mean, she doesn't remember being well as an adult. And we were able to flush her out, get her mitochondria back going, get her brain turned back on. And now she's enjoying her grandkids. You know, we don't want to tell our kids this more than her kids because she feels good. She's living well. She's out gardening and she's in her mid seventies now, right? Like she's not a, a spring chicken. You can recover. It is possible. You just simply have to figure out what your root causes are and what your body needs. And it has to be custom. There is no one-stop shop. One treatment fixes all in this situation. Just keep fighting. And that's, that's really, that's really all I got to say on this is because Great. when it comes to Lyme, it's not simple, but it's beatable. And that's a beautiful ending to this. This has been a great chat, Dr. Javen Moore. You know, thank you so much. Where do folks go to learn more about you right now? You know, it's my mission to educate. So we are on TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, and our website, and they're all Dr. Javen Moore. And we're putting out information every single day on all of the topics I discussed today or touched on, because the last thing I want is for another person to spend a few years in pain or in my case, pain and erectile dysfunction and just getting depressed and just not know where to look. Like, at least if you can put a target on something, you have some hope and a direction. So our goal is just to educate and give people that informed consent to make their medical decisions. Thank you for all that you do, Dr. Javen Moore. Really appreciate you being on this summit today. Thanks for having me, man.